Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Stefan Guillenet. Um, now, Stefan has a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Washington, where he also did his postdoctoral training. And he sort of specializes in the neuroscience of weight gain and weight loss. And he's the author of the book, The Hungry Brain, which is really a comprehensive guide um, of how the brain affects weight gain and weight loss. And you'll hear him say in the interview, he doesn't want to call it comprehensive um, because that would mean it includes everything. And he's sure there's things he left out. And that says a lot about him and about his personality and that he really does want to focus on the science and speak very in a very measured way about what the science truly says and truly doesn't. He always wants to default back to the science and he wants to be very clear about when he's speculating, when he's hypothesizing, or what the science says. And so I think that statement of his really says a lot about his personality, which is, which is something I really respect. You can find him at stephanguiana.com and also on Twitter at source. Um, and in this discussion, we really talk a lot about the, the neuroscience of why we gain weight and really try and nail them down on some of the practical tips of what we can do to help counteract the neuroscience, right? Because there's this environmental and uh, genetic mismatch of what, the way we're wired and the environment we're in. So we need to have, find ways to overcome that. And really, a lot of it does come down to this concept of satiety per calorie, getting the maximum satiety and fullness for the minimum number of calories, or at least finding the balance where you're going to have a diet that you're happy with, where you're hitting all your satiety and nutrition needs, but not overdoing your calories. And then also what role does um, exercise play into this? And what does he see as what we need for the future um, in terms of research and practical implications to really kind of get us out of this obesity mess. So let's get on with the interview here with Stefan Guillenet. Well, Stefan Guillenet, thanks so much for joining me on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thanks for having me on, Brett. Yeah, I really enjoy you know your Twitter handle, and I guess I that's how I know you through Twitter and through your book. So it's a it's a pleasure to be able to meet in person. Um, and you know, at the outset, I just want to hear a little bit about what you got, what got you interested to start in the whole world of the brain and the neuroscience of weight gain and weight loss, and and what what led you to you know do all your research and write your book in that area. Yeah, so I've always been interested in neuroscience, or I guess as long as I've been interested in any kind of science, I should say. Um, the brain is. As far as we know, it's the most complex object in the known universe, and it's the biggest, I would say, remaining frontier in human biology. And it's also the thing that makes us who we are more than anything else. And so it's always been a, a point of fascination to me to understand the brain. And um, so for undergrad, I ended up going to the University of Virginia and studying biochem, but with the intention of using that as a foundation for neuroscience. Um, and then I uh, went to the University of Washington, and uh, that's where I did my PhD work on neurodegenerative disease initially. So that was before I had developed an interest in obesity research. And uh, neurodegenerative disease is also fascinating, but um, during that time, I started to learn about body fat regulation. I started to learn that uh, the amount of fat a person carries is not a passive thing. It's a regulated thing. And I found that really fascinated, fascinating. I wanted to learn more. And eventually, I ended up doing a postdoc with Mike Schwartz, also at the University of Washington, studying the mechanisms of body fat regulation by the hypothalamus, a region in the brain. And really, you know, we were trying to understand how the system works and especially what happens that causes body fat to increase. So what, what, what is the change in this regulatory process that causes body fat to increase? And during the course of that work in my postdoc, I just came to understand that there was tons of really interesting research coming out on this that wasn't reaching the public at all. I mean, really barely at all. And um, it just seemed like a tremendous opportunity to me for science communication. And I've always really enjoyed science communication. And so um, after my postdoc, I decided not to pursue academic research. And uh, one of the things I did at that point was I wrote The Hungry Brain, which was my attempt to 
take all this information that I was encountering that I found so fascinating and that felt like it really uh, wasn't getting to the public and put it together in, in this kind of like, um, I hesitate to say comprehensive because obviously there's tons of stuff that my book leaves <laughs> out, but just kind of like high level uh, overview, at, at least an attempt at a, you know, semi complete explanation of what's going on. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the, the basic trajectory. Yeah. You know, and just in your answer, it shows a lot, I think about your approach and your personality that you choose your words carefully. You don't want to overstate things. And I, I, I think that's important. Um, and it, and it shows in your book too. And I think your book is a really good combination of the science and the practical aspects of things or so really, I'd say it's pretty comprehensive in terms of the science and, and the research, um, and, but also isn't just like a research compendium. It's also got plenty of practical advice and, and, um, and pr practical examples. So, but one thing I want to clarify, when people hear like the brain is the most important organ for weight gain and weight loss and the brain regulates your fat threshold or whatever, people may think like, oh, so that means I'm making the decisions. You know, it, it comes down to the, if it's the brain, it's your decision. So it's your fault if you're fat because you're making the bad decisions. But that's not at all what you're saying. So I just wanted to make sure that we clarify that right off the right off the bat. Yeah, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to clarify that. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So I mean, most of what happens in the brain is not consciously accessible to us, right? I mean, if you have the experience of feeling hunger, you didn't decide to feel hunger. That's just something that's arising from non-conscious parts of your brain. Same for cravings. You didn't say, hey, I want to have a craving right now. <laughs> you know, That's something that arises from non-conscious parts of your brain. And I mean, this happens with almost anything. Like how do you, you know, like how do you know how to count and know how to do math and remember where X, Y, Z is in your house? Like this is all just coming from non-conscious parts of your brain that you don't have direct access to. So most of what happens in your brain is not conscious and those non-conscious brain systems evolved to in a specific context that is not the context we find ourselves in today so you have all these systems that are working to regulate your food intake regulate your body fat level regulate all these different things in your behavior and your in your body a lot of it is non-conscious and these things worked really well a million years ago <laughs> They're just not really well suited to the modern environment. So they push us in the wrong direction. They create uh, appetites and drives and uh, regulatory drives that are just not um, constructive in, in our current environment. Yeah, the fact that we're here and survived as a species showed that these regulatory processes worked. But the question is, are we still going to be here a million years from now with these regulatory processes? So you you talk about in your book the genetic environmental mismatch, and that's a it's pretty clear that that's the situation we find ourselves in. And I think it's it's helpful to ask what is the main what is the most important part, or what are the most important parts of our environment that are the mismatch? You know, the ubiquitous availability of cheap you know, uh, energy dense, nutrient poor foods. Is that like first and foremost, number one in your mind or are there others? I think so. I mean, I think that it, I, I definitely think food is number one. Um, you know, I think we don't have a very precise understanding about what exactly it is about the food that causes obesity to occur. But if we look, um, just at a basic, very basic level, if we just kind of pull back and establish some baseline observations. Um, what we see is that in a variety of different species, if you give them a variety of calorie dense, palatable foods, they will greatly over consume calories and rapidly put on body fat. So this is observed in rodents, it's observed in, in a variety of different species that, you know, interact with human food in various ways. And um, and you see the same thing in humans. So if you put humans in a scenario where they have very easy access to a wide variety of calorie dense, palatable foods, they will uh, over consume and, and develop obesity. So something about that scenario is is causing a problem. Yeah. Um, and then you can you can look at the various animal and human data and you can say, 
you know, you can try to parse what exactly it is that's causing the problem and see like, can you replicate this just by using, you know, high dietary fat? Can you replicate this just by using high sugar? Can you replicate this just by doing variety or whatever, or whatever? And basically all of it seems to contribute to some degree. Um, and you don't really get the full effect without having the full kind of spectrum of, of qualities that palatable human food has. So, you know, you can, for example, if you just, uh, work, if all you're working with is nutritional composition, so you're like just playing with the amount of fat and carbohydrate and protein and how concentrated it is, you can make animals pretty fat. Um, but they do not get as fat. There is no nutritional composition of rodent pellet that you can give them that will make them as fat as quickly as giving them actual palatable human food in a wide variety. So there's something beyond just the nutrient content of those foods that is causing that to occur. So that's that's kind of a broad strokes description of of that and i think it's not just about the food um but i think food is the main thing yeah yeah and i, I love that that story in your book what was that the researcher had like well, i forget the specifics like a bowl of fruit loops or something and the rat came over and started eating the fruit loops and first of all what's a researcher doing eating his fruit loops in his lab but <laughs> second of all that the rat came this over was in and the started... 70s so okay yeah, regulations things were very different were... <laughs> yeah people would smoke cigarettes and pipes <laughs> i remember anyway I, I won't interrupt your story but yeah go ahead. but no i thought that was a great story in your book about how the rat really took to the fruit loops more than he would ever take to his rat chow and that really speaks to something so so if we're trying to boil it down and say the what is it about the food right we, we can talk about the macronutrient contents we can talk about energy density we could talk about you know fiber we can talk about um nutrition density there are all these different factors and they all play some role but it's almost like if they all play a role, then like no one of them is really the most important. And it can be confusing from that standpoint. And then to say, what should we address to solve the problem? Because, and we, we can circle back to this, but what got us into the problem might not be what gets us out of the problem. But with all those different factors, like how do you sort of think in your brain, which are the ones we should target first to help us, to help our brain, our unconscious brain, get over this environmental genetic mismatch? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. And, you know, if I had a more precise understanding of exactly what factors in the food were causing the problem, you know, what percentage of it exactly can be attributed to X, Y, Z, then I would probably have a, a more precise answer for you. Um, but I think, you know, if you look over the course of the obesity epidemic in the United States, and, and by the way, obesity rates have been increasing for a long time in the United States. It predates the, what we call the epidemic by a long time. But you know there was an acceleration around this time. And if you look at how our dietary habits changed, you see essentially a couple of, of really big things that stand out. One of them, the big picture thing is that we very much started outsourcing our food preparation. And this this was a long-term change that happened over, you know, has been ongoing for a long period of time, but essentially we have shifted from buying individual ingredients and cooking things in the home to having other people whether it's a restaurant or uh, you know, food corporation preparing our food for us. Yeah, and the other thing that we've seen is really this this complex of uh, increased food advertising, very very aggressive food advertising, starting in the mid seventies, um, increased snacking and between meal eating in general, and part of that was the rise of sugar sweetened beverages, which I think is an important contributor to rising obesity rates. So you have you have essentially this shift from people eating kind of simpler home cooked foods to eating primarily commercially prepared foods and especially adding extra meals throughout the day in the forms of these snack foods and these sugar sweetened beverages. 
And then you have all this stuff being kind of pushed through by heavy, heavy advertising. So what do we do about it? It's tough. I mean, I think if we wanted to essentially enact regulation that would push people in the direction of eating unrefined or less refined, lower calorie density foods, I think that would be very helpful. I also think that such regulation would be too heavy handed to be feasible in a country like the United States. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, our government doesn't exactly have a wonderful track record of enacting things for the benefit of people's health <laughs> at the expense of big corporations, which is what would have to happen. So I think we have reason to be skeptical that that would happen. So, so if we can't rely on government, and, and that's, I guess, what I mean by saying what got us into this problem probably isn't going to be what gets us out of this problem. Because what got us into this problem, like you're saying, and like we've talked about the ubiquitous nature of these uh, low or high energy density, low nutrition density foods that are hyper palatable and we're snacking on and so forth. So if the availability of those got us here, but we're not going to be able to get rid of them or legislate them, then what's another way out? So we can talk about some specific concepts, right? There's this concept of, of, um, energy density, energy density. So I already used it that statement three times and I blanked uh -huh. on it. Okay. All right. So there's the concept of energy density and we should just be eating less energy dense foods and that will potentially solve the problem. But so what I find is when you talk about one specific thing like that, like, okay, it's probably a good idea, but in isolation, it might not solve anything because that means eating salads all day long. And I think we've tried that and it doesn't work. So I guess the question is, does energy density play a role? Um, and um, what, what else do we need to combine with focusing on energy density to get us past the hurdles of the hungry brain? Yeah, I think it does play a role. I mean, so if, so I, I think it sounds like we are transitioning here from talking about like public health approaches to talking about individual approaches or so saying basically right. the government's not going to do it. What can we do? Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Cause I think maybe that shows my skepticism and my bias, but I'm, I'm highly skeptical that the government's going to be able to show us a way out of this. And how are we ever going to agree on what yeah. to tax, what to regulate, where do you draw the line? Like with tobacco, it's easy, right? You either smoke or you yeah. don't. Tamac, you don't need to, to smoke, but you need to eat. So we need to draw a line somewhere. And I don't see how we're going to be able to agree on what's evil, what's bad, what needs to be regulated. So, and most people, you know, are going to make their own decisions anyway. Um, so how are we going to advise people to find their own way out of this? Because like you said, it's all these unconscious areas of our brain that are controlling, that are controlling our hunger, that we can't simply decide not to feel hunger. We have to find a way that the way we live our lives and the food we put in our mouths don't trigger that hunger. I mean, I, I, I mostly agree with that. I would say there probably are some approaches that could be taken on public health. I think there are some things that most people agree on. Like, I think most people agree that sugar sweetened beverages are not something that contribute to health and, you know, leanness in any way. Um, and so I think there, you know, and there's food advertising. I think that's something that most people are pretty sympathetic, especially food advertising to kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, so I think there are some things that could be done, but you know, the scale of the problem here is enormous. Yeah. In the United States, 43% of people are classified currently or of adults are classified as having obesity. Lifetime obesity rates now is more than 50%. And so this is, you know, this is not a problem that we're going to solve by dinking around the edges of it. Um, so in that sense, I agree with you. I'm just, I'm just trying to say that I think there are some things that could be done, even if they're not necessarily going to solve the problem, maybe they'll help a little bit. Okay. But anyway, I, I agree that at least for the time being, we need to take care of ourselves. And I think there are a couple of different ways we can think about this. Um, you know, we can think about it as people who are trying to prevent themselves from gaining fat or uh, control their body fat in a kind of you know diet and lifestyle way. And then we can talk about what happens if you're a person who has obesity and you're seeking treatment. You know, you're seeking something that's more intensive. And I think those are different conversations. 
Um, but I'll, I'll address the first one first, because I think that's really what you're getting at in this question. I think so. I think energy density is relevant, but it's just not the only factor. It's a mm -hmm. factor. Um, and, you know, there there are short term data suggesting that it's a factor in satiety. So the um, you get more fullness per calorie if you're eating things that are lower calorie density. Basically, they fill up your stomach more and that sends a signal to your brainstem telling you to feel a little bit more full. Um, and then there are longer term studies suggesting that <clears throat> manipulating energy density can cause weight loss and, and aid in weight loss maintenance in, in people who have overweight and obesity. So, um, but you know, you can, people have accurately pointed out that you can go on diets that are higher in energy density and lose weight. So, you know, I know this is a common point that's made in the low carb community because low carb diets can be higher in energy density because higher proportion of fat and that can be compatible with weight loss. And so it's not this like dominant factor that steamrolls everything else. It's, it's one factor in a more complex picture of how food intake and, and body fatness are regulated. So yeah, there's, there's calorie density and, you know, the kind of a concept I would highlight is how filling a food is, the satiety values, value of foods. Um, I think that a lot of people will get a fair amount of mileage from this in their diet just by targeting satiety. So if you're eating foods that are lower calorie density, that are higher in protein, that are higher in fiber, that are not super palatable, you're going to have a diet that just doesn't push your brain to overconsume calories. And the nice thing about it is you get the same level of fullness. You're not stopping before you're full. You're just eating to your normal level of fullness, mm -hmm. but you have consumed fewer calories because that food is inherently more filling. Yeah, hey, I think that's a great point. This the, the concept of satiety per calorie, that you can hit your satiety mark however you want. You could hit it with 3,000 calories per day, or you could hit it with 1,500 calories per day, and the food you choose makes a difference. So, And also what you brought up, the, the protein and the fiber and the energy density together. Because I know what some people have said was, well, we just need to add protein and fiber to the the chips and the packaged foods and, but no, cause then it's a highly energy dense food with protein and fiber. So trying to balance the protein, the fiber and the low energy density. So one thing that I think that has led us down this path and in your book, you talk about the dietary guidelines and there's a big debate, you know, did the dietary guidelines cause us to become, you know, to have this obesity epidemic or did it just create the environment for it to happen? But it, whatever, that's a discussion for another day. But the point being when we went from full fat milk to low fat milk or non fat milk or non fat chocolate milk or you know this this fear of fat to get us away from fat has created the environment for the the energy dense hyper palatable food so do you think um <laughs> i'm definitely a lawyer leading the witness here but do, but do you think that um getting rid of the fear of fat and just instead focusing on whole foods regardless of the fat content just focus on whole foods and don't fear fat would that be a a good step towards a more a higher satiety per calorie diet to then help us sort of inch our way out of this um, obesity epidemic. Yes, um, I mean I am in favor of whole foods generally as as a heuristic, a rule of thumb, um, and I am also favorable toward whole foods that have a higher proportion of fat. So, you know, things like nuts and dairy. I don't think fat is irrelevant, so I, I wouldn't want to convey that message. But I do think that the fat per se is, in, in terms of the amount of calories that we're eating and the impact on body fatness, I don't think fat per se is really the thing that we should necessarily be caring about, or at least not something we should be focusing on. I think more calorie density and palatability are, are going to be more important. So, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between eating nuts or eating, uh, an, e a whole egg versus using a large amount of butter and oil, you know, adding a large amount of butter and oil to 
to a dish. Uh, in my view, those are two fundamentally different scenarios that are going to have different effects on appetite and, and body fatness. Yeah, and I think that's a good differentiation. And and look, there are always going to be pockets, and they could be potentially big pockets, of people who are going to succeed in either way. People eating an 80% carb diet and can maintain a healthy weight, and people eating a very high-fat diet full of oils and, and butter and cream and, and, and maintaining weight. But when addressing the public for the average person um, and trying to hit the satiety per calorie, yeah, right, then I think you're right that the message then becomes – focus on the whole foods, the fat that comes with the whole foods, and you can add a little extra fat to enjoy it and for taste, but not as like a, a purposeful thing to want to get more fat because that's necessarily a good thing. I think that, I think that makes sense for sort of the average person. Yeah. Um, I tend to, the concept that I think about is limiting added fats, but not limiting fats in general. And yeah. I absolutely recognize that, you know, there are people who have eaten a lot of added fats and fatty foods in general and lost weight. I just don't think that that is, um, that's not the reason they lost weight. The reason they lost weight is they're severely restricting carbohydrate. And the, you know, the fact that they're using a lot of added fat is not, that's not the thing that's causing them to lose weight. It's the carbohydrate restriction. So, right. you know, if you have a person who's not restricting carbohydrate and they're adding a bunch of fat, it's not going to cause them to lose weight. It's going to cause <laughs> them to gain weight. And we have trials you know, showing that. So, yeah. um, I think, I think that is kind of the, the concept, um, that I like to distinguish. Yeah. I was at, I have a funny story about that. I was at a, a barbecue a little while ago and someone who I hadn't seen in years, um, came up to me at the barbecue. So he's eating his taco with the beans, the rice, the tortilla, drinking his beer. And he goes, Hey, I saw you on, on YouTube. And I was great to hear that I can eat all the fat I want now. And I was like, uh, not exactly, as he's drinking his beer and eating his his taco, and, and yeah, that's exactly, exactly. The, yeah, so exactly what you're saying. That's the wrong message to give. But you could say yeah. that for for people who are reducing their carbohydrates and eating more fat, it's eating more fat that sort of allows them to reduce their carbohydrates because that's where they're getting the energy from, and that's you know helping them enjoy their meals and and stay full and. And, and, and just, you know, eat something that they're, they can eat long term. So it's not the reason, you know, re reducing the carbs is the reason, but what else you eat makes a difference and it's being sustainable and enjoying it and yeah. being able to do it long term. So in that situation, that, that definitely does make sense. Um, I know we're, we're jumping around a little bit, but I also wanted to go back and talk about this, this lipostat, because it's probably a term most people haven't heard, um, but it features fairly prominently in your books. So, and I think it, I think it, um, really adds to the understanding and the discussion of why some people really struggle with weight loss. So give us a, an overview of the lipostat and why it's so important for uh, weight loss and weight gain. Yeah. So the lipostat is a name that's been given to the body fat regulating system in the brain. So um, the brain obviously regulates a lot of different things. And there's a part of the brain that specializes in uh homeostatic regulation, which is regulation to try to keep some physiological variable within some range. And that's the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus contains literally a thermostat that regulates your body temperature. And the way it does that is by using both physiology and behavior. So, you know, if your hypothalamus detects that you're cold or you are under threat of low core body temperature because your skin sensors are saying, you know, I'm in cold water or whatever, it will contract blood vessels on your skin. That's a physiological response. It will enact be behavioral responses, make you want to get out of the water or put a sweater on or go somewhere warm or, you know, cross your arms, do a different posture. And so there's this integrated physiological and behavioral response that supports this, uh, this regulatory process that is um, managed, that's governed by this, this part of your hypothalamus. And uh, this is basically the same way it works for, for body fatness, although the, the, it's more complicated. Um, there, is a, um, there are regions of the hypothalamus that act sort of like a thermostat for your, your body fat levels. 
like a thermostat, it measures temperature. So these regions of the hypothalamus, they measure your body fat levels using a hormone called leptin. And then your hypothalamus have a, has a certain temperature range. It's trying to keep your body within. Your hypothalamus has a certain body fat level. It's trying to keep you within. And if you deviate from that, it um, engages physiological and behavioral responses that bring you back to the, the desired range. And so um, this has been best characterized in the concept in the context of fat loss. So um, actually, before I go there, let me just say that the unlike your temperature set point, your body fat set point can really change quite radically. Um, it can be very different between individuals. It can change over the course of one individual's life. Temperature set point can change too. Fever is a good example of that. Um, but it's, you know, you go up a few degrees for a while and then you come back down. So that that's uh, not really what happens with, with the body fat set point. And so we call the system the lipostat. The, the lipostat means, you know, lipo is fat and stat means uh, keeping constant. So it's the system that tries to keep fat levels constant. And the existence of this has been demonstrated empirically by studies that overfeed or underfeed people. Basically, if you underfeed people, you get this pushback from uh, both physiological and behavioral systems. So if you underfeed people, they get hungry, they, you know, find uh, their brain kind of like guides them through various ways of getting more food via, you know, appetite and biased attentional processes and, uh, you know, increased food reward. They think the food's more tasty. Hunger is the best sauce. <laughs> and, um, and then also physiology. So energy expenditure can be curtailed to conserve energy. So, and then, and then what you see basically, if you, if you, you know, cause someone to eat fewer calories and lose weight, generally they will rebound over time. Like if you stop whatever the intervention was that you did, if you stop it, if they're not trying to restrict calories anymore, they'll go back up to their former weight and they'll be very similar to where they started. So it's not just like random where your weight is. Um, and then similarly for overfeeding, if you overfeed somebody and then you stop, usually they will go back down pretty quickly either to their former weight or maybe a little bit higher. Sometimes they will retain some, some weight and fat, but most of it goes away really quite rapidly. And so we know there's a system that defends against both fat loss and fat gain, at least acutely. Um, obviously that system doesn't work very well over the course of someone's life because most of us gain fat. Um, but um, it's been characterized particularly well in, in the downward direction. In other words, the mm -hmm. way that it defends against fat loss. So, you know, people with obesity, for the most part, do not want to have obesity. And you can see this in the survey data. Each year in the United States, about two-thirds of people with obesity attempt to lose weight via a variety of strategies, usually some, something diet related. And yeah, and so most people would rather not carry this excess body fat. And um, yet they are typically unable to get rid of it. Yeah, and the, and the mechanism of this has been fairly well characterized. So essentially what happens is when you start losing body fat, your leptin levels drop. So leptin levels are, are proportional to the amount of fat you carry. Your leptin levels drop, and that's a starvation signal to your brain. Your mm -hmm. brain says, this is not good. We're losing energy. We don't have as much energy as we needed or as, as we want to have. And so it engages this, what I call the starvation response, which is this behavioral and physiological program to regain lost fat. So you're, the brain of a person with obesity does not want to lose fat. And that's why they re generally rebound quickly um, when they do lose because they're fighting against this behavioral and physiological program engaged by non-conscious parts of their brain. And it's 
not designed for you to be able to override it. <laughs> right. Right. It almost seems unfair that it's more genetically and evolutionarily hardwired to prevent weight loss than it is to prevent weight gain. It, it almost seems unfair. unfair. Yeah. Oh, it's terribly unfair. And a yeah. lot of it is, is genetic, you know, susceptibility to obesity is very strongly influenced by genes. It's very unfair. Yeah. Um, but well, you mentioned the starvation response though. So it, it seems like a key then would be to lose weight in a way that doesn't trigger that response, that doesn't trigger the lipostat to say, okay, we need to hold on. So, you know, there are lots of, of different theories about what can do that. One of them is having low insulin levels allowing your body to burn its own body fat more efficiently so you're still getting energy from the burned body fat. Um, now, that's obviously a, a, a theory behind low-carb eating that, that comes under, under scrutiny for, from a number of different groups who, who feel like it's just all about you know, calories and not so much about carbs and insulin. And not to say it's all about carbs and insulin, right? But does this have a role in helping with weight loss in a way that might theoretically satisfy the lipostat a little bit better. I think there's something to macronutrient restriction that may help satisfy the lipostat. Um, so if you, you know, like, and, and just think about it this way, like when I'm, when I'm thinking about what, when I'm trying to, okay, um, we don't have direct evidence on what is having what effect on the lipostat. You know, we, we, can, yeah. we don't have a window where we can look in and see the dial, you know, changing. <laughs> that would be um, nice. <laughs> and so, you know, what I try to do is look for indirect signs of it. So right. can we find evidence that this behavioral and physiological program to fight weight loss is not being engaged? And so what, what would you look for in that kind of scenario? Well, you would look for a person who is just eating to appetite, not actively trying to manipulate calorie intake or whatever, and right. their weight is going down and they're at a new weight and they're comfortable there and they're not experiencing this, you know, strong pushback that they're having to consciously struggle with. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I very much recognize that describes the experience of some people who go on low carbohydrate diets. I mean, I think that to some degree, that would be the typical experience. I would say, like, you know, most of the low carb diet RCTs, people are not counting calories, and on average, these people are losing weight, right? So, I think that would be the typical experience. Um, but I think, you know, if we take a big picture perspective, we need to have an explanation for that that also explains the fact that that happens on low fat diets as well that are higher in carbohydrate. And so, you know, the latest Cochrane review, I don't know if you saw this on uh, meta-analysis of low carb and, and, and other diets is saying that I can't remember whether the comparator was, was low fat or just other diets. Um, I think it was they, just in other diets. They use any other control diet, I believe. Okay. All right. So that's not really a great um, illustration of my point, but um, if we look at a study like the diet fits trial, for example, that had equal intensity interventions that one was low fat, one was low carb, got pretty similar weight loss um, over the course of a year. You know, you could make an argument, I think, that low carb diets might cause more weight loss over six months or maybe even a little bit more over 12 months on average. But like the fact is they're both causing weight loss and the difference is not that large once you get to a year in randomized controlled trials. And so, and you know, this is not, I, I'm really not trying to have like a pissing contest at all. I'm just trying to <laughs> illustrate because I don't think that's productive, but I'm just trying to illustrate that whatever theory we have has to explain both of these observations. And well, and it's not that one theory exists in exclusion to all the others. That's certainly not what I'm, what I'm saying, or th and and I think you would agree with that. Like, you know, different aspects of different diets can work potentially in different means. If it, you know, if insulin is part of the effect of low carb diets, that doesn't mean everything has to lower insulin to help you lose weight. It just means other, you know, higher carb diets may work by another, another. Um, uh, physiological process that still affects 
the lipostat in some people. And I think it's clear that the lipostat isn't the same in everybody, like you've said. I mean, I, is that a pretty reasonable statement? Absolutely, that it's not the same in everyone. Um, so here, here's my thinking. I don't really know. I, you know, I, I've argued over the years that insulin is probably not the primary cause of common obesity. I'm less confident about what role it might play in weight loss on a low carbohydrate diet. So I don't have very strong opinions on that. But what I will say is that I'm not aware of evidence that insulin reduction impacts the lipostat. So if there is a mechanism in that regard, I'm not aware of it or how it would work. That's a very fair scientific statement. That, uh, that this is sort of a proper scientific statement, right? We could <laughs> we could hypothesize and talk about what might be, where we talk about the evidence. And so you're you're clear about about what evidence exists and doesn't. So that makes sense. Well, so one one thing you do talk about in your book that affects the liposat though is exercise. And this is I find really interesting because you know, from the, in the eighties, it was all about just do your cardio, put your time in and you're going to lose weight. And now it's come sort of full circle to being like, no exercise does nothing for weight loss. And maybe mm -hmm. both extremes are kind of not exactly correct. So in your, in your book, you talk about how exercise can affect the lipostat and, um, how maybe this concept of exercise doesn't impact weight loss is really overblown. So give us a little bit what you think the evidence supports for exercise and weight loss. Yeah. So I want to say that you know, this is, there are some parts of my book that revolve around this that I would update if I were to write it again. So um, I think that Herman Ponser's work has been an update for me on the, with the constrained energy expenditure model, just to make sure everybody's following along. Essentially, what he's arguing is that um, when, when you exercise, obviously you're burning energy, you know, we get hot and we start sweating. Um, but if you do that habitually, your body adapts and it essentially cuts back on other things in order to keep the total amount of energy your body burns in a day relatively constant. So basically doing that exercise doesn't increase your total calorie expenditure as much as, as, as we thought. And I think, that's, I think that's right. I think there's some truth to it. I'm, I'm fairly well convinced of that at this point. Um, and, and that was not reflected in my book. And I think, you know, that's one thing that I would like to update if I ever do, a um, another edition, but, um, I think that exercise, you know, we have lots of randomized controlled trials on exercise. And if you look at the trials that actually observed and enforced exercise and had a substantial amount of it, people do lose weight and fat. So I, I do object to this idea that exercise is just completely ineffective for fat loss. I don't think that's right. I think what is right is that it doesn't cause as much fat loss as you might predict purely based on the number of calories that it burns. And, I, and actually, it's quite a bit less. So I think that's accurate. And as a standalone weight loss method, I think for most people, it's not, it's not that great. Um, but it can be an adjunct to diet-based interventions. And it's also very good for, for health. I also think that um, exercise probably is more effective when we're talking about weight maintenance and prevention of weight gain to begin with. Um, and this is where we get toward, well, I guess all of it is relevant to the lipostat uh, question that you asked. Um, you know, it's, it's been observed in animal models that, you know, and this, the reason I bring up animal models is because these are the most tightly controlled experiments that we have on this subject. But if you give them a fattening diet and you put a running wheel in their cage such that they can voluntarily exercise, and they do typically quite a bit, um, it attenuates their fat gain. It, it makes them gain less fat, typically. It, you know, results can vary, but the most common outcome is that it, reduces the amount of fat that they gain over time as a result of a, of a fattening diet. And um, in humans, we see kind of similar things. So i um, trying to remember the guy's name who originated this hypothesis. Um, I don't know, maybe it'll come to me later, but there's this idea that essentially at very low levels of physical activity, our appetite becomes dysregulated. 
and we inappropriately overconsume food. And if we start exercising a little bit, our calorie intake actually goes down. But then you keep exercising more and more and more and your calorie intake will go back up a little bit. But there's basically that very low physical activity zone where this has been observed in animals, it's been observed in human observational studies, where essentially people are inappropriately over consuming calories when they're very, very sedentary. And that state is correlated with weight gain over time. Um, and so I speculate that that may be because of impacts on, of exercise on a lipostat. Essentially, for whatever reason, the system just doesn't work that great if you're not regularly physically active and it favors uh, inappropriately high calorie intake. Yeah. And I think that's one of the interesting things about exercise in general. And you mentioned some studies in your book that in some of the studies, half the people consumed more calories on an exercise routine and half the people consumed fewer calories on the exact same exercise routine. And, and I mean, that's enough to drive you crazy though. Cause you're like, look, I want to know, does exercise make me eat more or doesn't, but you, you know, when, when the research shows 180 degrees in the same study, it's hard to know. And that's yeah, why and I this think, is, well, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Fin no, no, please. Okay. And, and it's interesting. Cause I mean, I don't know if you've ever encountered people like this, but I know people who will swear up and down that they gain weight and fat when they exercise. Yeah. And I believe them, you know, I don't think they're lying. I think it's just, it's uncommon, but I think that there are people like that. Yeah, it's interesting. And there are a couple of things behind that though. There's also the behavioral aspect of it, of the, you know, whether you recognize it or not, like, oh, I exercise today so I can eat a little more, I can treat myself or whatever. And, you know, that's not the way exercise is supposed to work. It's just supposed to be a part of life, not a reason to treat yourself. Um, so that could definitely do it. But it's also, that's the conscious drive, but there's also the unconscious drive that it probably does affect lipostat in different ways in different people and different types of exercise too. So are we talking about, you know, a 10 mile run or are we talking about a 20 minute hit exercise or, you know, resistance training? Because I don't know, personally, I, I see that I get different levels of hunger um, among those different types of exercise. And so it matters. And so when you're talking about somebody who's maybe doing a 30 minute walk or a yoga class or, you know, some band work and resistance training, are those going to affect their hunger differently? And I don't know that there's good research to point us one way or the other for that, other than for people to do their own experiment and see how they feel from their hunger. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, there is research. I'm not really familiar with it. Um, I, I know there is research on effects, acute effects. So in other words, like what happens that same day on to your appetite when you do different types of exercise. Um, I'm not real familiar with it. And I, I'm a little bit like, I guess, I would like to see longer term studies. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to put a large amount of weight on what happens to the meal that you eat right after you exercise, you know, versus like what happens if you do this regularly for weeks or months or whatever. Right. Great point. Um, so that's kind of why I haven't really dug into that real hard, but I know there's at least some research on acute effects, but I'm not real, not real familiar with it. Okay. Well, you brought up Herman Ponzer's research um, when he, when he studied the hunter gatherer tribes showing that they walk all day long, they get so much walking in, but their total energy expenditure is not any higher than the person sitting on the couch when controlled for um, body composition and, and body leanness. But as I remember it, there was also like the farmers were, um, were a separate group and they actually did have an increase in their, in their expenditure, which to me makes me wonder, is it because we're talking about the cardio of the walking or sort of the resistance training of the farmers and the physical work that they do? So could you... I mean, that didn't study this, but could you then hypothesize that maybe it's the it's the resistance training more than the cardio that is increasing the energy expenditure? And because on the one hand, it's a little depressing his his results, right? That you can exercise all you want and you're not going to increase your energy expenditure, so it's not going to really matter in the long run for weight loss. But I would say, well, wait, wait, wait. There's this other group here that may be giving us another clue. Did you did you happen to draw any any connections? There? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a great point. I do recall that. Um, and so just to flesh that out a little bit, the farming group 
I don't remember what group it was, but they had very high levels of physical activity, higher than the Hadza. And so, yeah. um, but you know, I think that kind of non-industrial farming work is actually more akin to cardio than, than resistance exercise. I mean, these people are digging holes and, you know, weeding their gardens. They're not like lifting large amounts of weight. Um, I think, you know, typical agricultural work in a non-industrial society is, is just kind of like grinding all day, <laughs> low level, <laughs> low level work. So, but, but I think, I think this brings up a point, which is that, you know, Herman, his kind of argument is that physical activity really barely makes any difference at all on energy yeah. expenditure. And I think that's not really, um, that's not widely accepted. And, uh, I would say if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably a bit of, uh, taking it a little too far, taking the idea a little too far. So do you look in, um, there are exercise, big exercise trials that have been done where they monitored and enforced exercise in a group of volunteers. So like, <laughs> I don't think they were whipping anyone, but I, you know, they had them as part of the study and they had an actual research facility with exercise machines and they had people actually come in and they, you know, coach them and observe them. And so really good compliance. That's really the key. And if you look at those studies, you see that people's total energy expenditure went up. Their body fat went down. Typically, their energy expenditure went up. Not as much as you would expect. So it's there does seem to be some constraint, but their energy expenditure did go up. So I don't know. This is an active area of research, and I'm not, you know, at the level of expertise that Herman and the other people debating this are at on this topic. Um, but my impression is that the truth might be somewhere in between where there is a relationship between exercise level, habitual exercise level and physical and, uh, total energy expenditure, but it's just not nearly as large as a kind of naive model would, would have predicted. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Well, I'd love to get Herman on to discuss this too. So if you know him, put in a good word for me so we can get him on the show. I'm sure he'd be happy to, to speak yeah. to you about it. All right. Well, let's let's wind down here for a little summary then. So um, there's it's, we have the genetic environmental mismatch. We have unconscious behaviors that are, are in our current environment driving us to gain weight and unfortunately also sort of in a way preventing us from, from losing that weight. So we need to find strategies to overcome those. Um, and there are a number of different potential approaches. And we have science that, you know, is where you can control everything people eat in a meticulous manner, but only last for a couple of weeks. And then we have science where you can give recommendations, but can't actually control what they eat that lasts for years. And they have different implications because one is sort of the more clinically oriented of, you know, this is what we're going to recommend you do and let's see if it works. And the other is the basic science of how the body responds. So looking at that environment of the science, and since you're, you know, your specialty is evaluating the science and, and understanding what the science says, what do we need? What is the science we need in the future to help us answer the most pressing questions or how, of how are we going to help prevent and reverse this obesity epidemic? I think that the most important things we need right now are, first of all, in, in the diet and lifestyle sphere, how can we maximize compliance with uh, dietary interventions? So compliance is a really big uh, factor in um, effectiveness of diets for yeah. weight control. So yeah. how can you make it as easy as possible for people? How can that, you know, really be, really help them get into that groove and stay in that groove to adhere to slimming diet and lifestyle habits? Um, I think that research really um, would be really, really helpful. And I think, you know, there's a lot of research right now going into medical and pharmacological obesity management. This is not something we talked about today, but, you know, we have this new weight loss drug, Wegovy, that is highly effective. And 
you know, people with obesity, most people with obesity are going to struggle and probably not going to be able to become lean through just diet and lifestyle. And that is unfortunate, but true. Um, and so I think we need other, we need research that come, that is, um, creating better medical approaches like pharmacological approaches, drugs, and other things that just get better and better, more and more effective at supporting people in weight management as well. Yeah, I think that's a good point of bringing up the, the whole medical um, side of this because it's not that each exists in their own vacuum, but they can be used together and synergistically and at different times as temporary or longer term solutions for one another. So I think that's a good point that you, you brought it around to that. And yeah, and I think that's exactly what we need. We need yeah. a comprehensive solution that leverages all the tools that we have. Great. Great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast today and share your thoughts and, and your understanding of the science. And I appreciate how you're, you're, you're specific and measured in the way you speak because you don't want to overclaim things. And I think that's a, a big problem of what we have in today's society that people are over speaking what the science says. So, so thank you for bringing us down to the level of what the science says and, <laughs> and, and keeping us to that. So I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks for having me. 